All righty. So we are one minute past the hour. So I think I'm going to jump in and start here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We are thrilled to see this big and diverse group joining us to discuss HVAC choices for student health and learning. And thank you all for spending this hour with us. It is definitely going to be jam packed. Before we jump into the webinar, I wanted to start with a couple of announcements for you. First, please be aware that the audience will stay muted throughout the webinar to avoid any mishaps. But that being said, we would love to hear from you during the webinar. Please type any questions that you might have into the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And you can leave questions for us at any point during the webinar and we'll hold them to answer until the end. And then lastly, this webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording by email when it is ready. Next slide. So my name is Emma Hines and I'll be one of your moderators today. I am speaking to you on behalf of RMI, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute. We are a nonprofit organization working to accelerate the clean energy transition. And I work on a really unique team here focused on the health benefits of transitioning away from fossil fuels in our buildings. And I'll pass to my partner, Sarah Ross, for a quick introduction now too. Great, thanks Emma. Uh, my name is Sarah Ross. I'm a co-founder at Undaunted K-12. Undaunted is a national nonprofit with a mission to support America's K-12 public schools to make an equitable transition to zero carbon emissions while also preparing young people to build sustainable futures in rapidly changing climate. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks, Sarah. And we are also very lucky to be joined by three speakers today. Each will introduce themselves in a bit, in a little bit more detail, but as a quick overview for you all, our speakers today are Dr. Erica Etland from Perkins and Will, Wyatt Ross from CMTA, and Julia Casagrande from the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Next slide. So before I pass to each of our speakers who are going to present on pretty distinct subject matter, part of my role here today is to provide some introductory remarks and a little bit of context to help construct a cohesive narrative be between the three. So to make sure that we're all on the same page and have a basic understanding, when we talk about HVAC systems or HVAC, we're talking about the heating, cooling, and ventilation equipment that's used to keep the air in our buildings a comfortable temperature and humidity and clean from any pollution or viruses. And there are three big motivators behind this webinar, and these have also underpinned Sarah and I's work on this for the past year and brought us together in the first place. So to walk through those, the first motivator is increased attention. So we probably all know that we are now officially three years out from the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And if there's one thing that has been reinforced yet again, it's this critical role that HVAC equipment plays in schools for disease mitigation and how school leaders can select the best equipment for that and beyond. The next motivator is increased need. So COVID is obviously still a great example of this, but to pull another one, we've also been seeing the impacts of school closures and lost learning time from extreme heat, especially in schools lacking cooling. And this is going to continue to be a problem here in the US, demonstrating a really clear need for all schools to have adequate cooling in place. And then finally, the third motivator for us being here today is increased funding. So we're recognizing that we're in this moment where that increased attention and increased need are being met with a new funding landscape with more than one source of funds like the Inflation Reduction Act and ESSER funds as well. And this is allowing states and jurisdictions and school districts to invest in their HVAC systems making it important that we get those investments right. Next slide. So over the past year, Sarah and I have worked to solidify our thinking on this topic and to also make something of our desire to educate and advocate for cleaner and healthier schools. So we did what most folks do and we wrote a report and it was published back in January. So we're using this webinar to uplift its messages again, but also the voices of our three expert guests today. 
There's one more nugget from this report, though, that carries over into the naming and framing of our webinar here today, which is the title of having choices when it comes to our HVAC systems in schools. So we set up a framework in the report of legacy and modern um, HVAC equipment, and it's important that we communicate with you all here the distinctions between these two because you're going to hear us and our speakers talk about the importance of transitioning from that legacy to modern equipment. Next slide. So let's start with legacy HVAC equipment. These systems rely on burning fossil fuels. That can be things like gas, oil, or propane, and they're burned on site in our school buildings to make heat, which is a relatively inefficient process. Some common examples in the school environment are systems like boilers and central packaged units, they may or may not be supplemented with air conditioning, and many don't accommodate advanced ventilation and filtration. It's also really important to note that when we say legacy, that we're not necessarily talking about the age of the equipment, but more so about the approach to making heat. So a brand new gas boiler is still in this legacy camp because it uses this outdated and inefficient approach to keeping buildings comfortable. Next slide. On the other hand though, modern systems, instead of making heat, they move heat that already exists in the air or in the ground. And by using this approach of moving heat, we can both heat and cool our indoor spaces with just one really cool piece of equipment. And that's called a heat pump. This approach doesn't involve combustion of fossil fuels. It can be powered with clean, renewable energy, and it's vastly more efficient than burning fossil fuels, and it does a better job of ventilation and filtration. This transition to modern equipment is already happening in leading schools today, which you'll hear about in a little bit, and it really is the future for all schools. Next slide. So I'll wrap up this background by sharing that there are three key messages that we want to deliver in today's webinar, and each of our guests will speak on a portion of these messages. So the first big one is that transitioning to modern HVAC systems is critical to student health and learning. Our second message is that over the past few years, and especially now with the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, that the economics are changing in favor of all electric and high performance HVAC options. And then third, which is really exciting, is that we already have fantastic examples of how states and jurisdictions and school districts are taking action on this transition. So now with all of that background in mind, it is my pleasure to hand the mic over to our first speaker, Dr. Erica Etland, who is a true expert in connecting building quality to student health and performance. And she is going to dive deeper into this first key message for us. So take it away from here, Erica. Awesome, thank you, Emma. Uh, hi, everybody. I get to be sort of today's hype woman, I think, which is, so my name is Dr. Erica Etland, and I'm the director of the Human Experience Lab here at Perkins and Will. And much of my research is focused on how K-12 buildings impact child health, and really, what do we do about it? So to kick us off today, I'm going to go into two critical questions. First, the why now and why HVAC. So we're going to get into it. So the first piece here is that this is not new. And this discussion of ventilation in K-12 is not really something we have ever left in our sort of discussion. You know, it dates back to reducing tuberculosis infections in the early 20th century. And yet, what's interesting to me when I look at these images from almost 100 years ago, we weren't able to radically change the way that we responded to this last pandemic. We had outdoor classrooms, we opened windows. And so on the next slide, it highlights the fact that this is, you know, our buildings need to be thinking about this radically and that as we modernize our K-12 buildings, that this isn't just sort of improving air quality for a pandemic. It's even looking right before. So if we think about 2019, we had a measles outbreak that spread through coughing and sneezing. This impacted 22 states at the highest level since 1992. Then we see that this is an equity issue. And so we're also recognizing that there's just persistent inequities when we think about asthma, which is a, you know, a, 
one of the largest determinants of chronic absenteeism. And then we just have seasonal issues like you know seasonal flu that is impacting 18 states also in 2019. So as I go through this and I think about, well, why now? On the next slide, it's really about getting into the data. And so we have growing evidence that our K-12 facilities are in need of replacement or repairs. And you know, if we look at this 2020 congressional report, um, what we see is that 54% of public school districts needed to update or replace multiple building systems, but 41% of school districts needed significant HVAC system updates. And so this is equivalent to 36,000 schools nationwide. So this is a really important time for us to think about, well, what is this evidence and what do we do about it? So next, let's get into the sort of why now from a, a human side, you know, we all fall into the the trap of maybe prioritizing the building, but it really comes down to people. And so when we think about improving our students' environmental quality, it's going to have lasting impact on their growth and development. So every decision we make now actually helps when we think about the fact that by the time our students graduate 12th grade, they've spent 15,000 hours in their school building, their lungs have continued to develop and sort of function in a certain way. We know that kids are breathing 50% more air. And so all of these aspects are leading to sort of an increased susceptibility that we need to be thinking about. This isn't just an office building. This is really something where the people who occupy this space make this an important priority. And so on the next slide, we talked about, you know, well, what is that growing evidence in research? Well, back in 2017, uh, you know, with the Healthy Buildings team at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, we started to dive into what were the nine foundations of a healthy building. And what we found was ventilation, air quality, thermal health, dust pests, all are having radical impacts on our child and teacher health. And so this was sort of an early framework for us to think about. And I would say through the pandemic, we've had the ability to maybe expand it to other social and emotional holistic health perspectives. But for today, I want us to just get into this. So um, next slide, we see that we have this incredible report that kind of does all the synthesis for you. So if you're enthusiastic about acoustics, by all means, knock yourself out. But we found out that what was really important is that there's this incredible body of research that goes beyond even our RMI report, but allows us to really understand what happens if we don't make these health-based decisions. So Basically, on the next slide, what we see is that there was a central thesis of this document, which was that health is actually foundational to student thinking and performance. So for every day that a child is in a classroom that's too hot, too stuffy, there's direct impacts on their ability to focus, to be attentive. And so at the end of an academic year, what are you really measuring? Are you measuring sort of their actual ability or is it sort of being influenced by the student's environmental conditions that are impacting those test scores? So this is sort of why this is relevant, but I want us to get into why HVAC specifically. So if we get into this, what we see is that there's actually lots of sources of these indoor air quality pollutants. And it's everything from the furniture and what chemicals are in our products. So if we think real micro, thinking about viral particles like you know, seasonal flu or COVID, we also have bring in other you know uh, common pollutants this can be things like our adhesives our supplies and then it gets into stuff that is driven by our building so it could be our school occupants so the building as itself so thinking about on-site combustion when we think about some of that legacy hvac aspect to it we also see that some of our past building materials have migrated into the dust creating this legacy pollutant situation that we need to be thinking about we have seasonal pollutants things like allergens pollen even just wildfires that we know can track across the united states and then even the siting of the building is it located close to traffic major uh, airports, other sort of waste uh, sites as well. So these are just important factors for us to be considering of, okay, there's the soup around us and how are we going to respond? And that's on our next slide is really thinking about ventilation and filtration as a true spectrum. So there's three main goals of ventilation. One is to just control and remove some of those airborne pollutants. The second is to dilute indoor air with fresh or clean air. And that's the assumption that the outdoor air is cleaner than our indoor air. And then the third is managing temperature and humidity. So these are opportunities for us to think that it's not, well, do you have ventilation? There's lots of you know, nuance in that conversation that we'll get into today. But again, focused on health, if I think about the next slide, what we see here 
is that, again, that foundational piece, we know that when we underventilate our classrooms, we have increases in viral infections, increase of wheeze, sick building syndrome symptoms, um, even just satisfaction decreases. And with that comes, you know, decrements in attention, comprehension, concentration. So no wonder then we see that there's impacts on our standardized tests. And I love the study on the next uh, slide, which is just basically saying that you know, a poorly ventilated classroom is equivalent to a student skipping breakfast. And yet we have universal breakfast, you know, programs across the U.S. to fill that need because we know it's important. And so to me, some of this work really gets down to an equity piece. So if I look at the next slide, what we see is that African, Amer uh, African American and Hispanic students, as well as free and reduced lunch students, are expect experiencing high levels of um, indoor temperature. So this isn't just about sort of the, the pollutant side, it's also about the temperature that they're taking their tests. And so what we find is that they're compared to their white Caucasian counterparts or their more affluent counterparts who are typically in that optimal temperature for test performance, we see that there's this discrepancy. So when we talk about HVAC, it's really also an equity piece. And so to kind of nerd out a little bit more on thermal comfort, on the next slide, one thing I would like us to sort of start thinking about, and this was really critical in the healthy buildings work uh, at Harvard with Joe Allen, was really shifting our conversation around thermal comfort, which is really just a subjective measure of, you know, how hot are you in this space? You know, are you comfortable? in this environment and really acknowledging that children have higher baseline metabolic rates, they have higher core body temperatures, their ability to acclimatize is not the same. And so when we even think about you know, how some of these standards were created like ASHRAE 55, we find that you know, they're not maybe meeting the needs of a very sort of active third grade class perhaps, and that they were based on sort of men in three piece suits. So we have to sort of shift our thinking to something around thermal health. And so this is an assessment that's bringing in some of those personal factors, clothing and metabolic rate and physical activity. So on the next slide, we're jumping into the fact that, you know, we see that there's this U-shaped uh, relationship, that there's also cold stress as well as heat stress. And so being able to provide both heating and cooling in our buildings is critical because when we see that we kind of go to those either extremes, there's impacts on, you know, our memory, our reasoning and our skills that make us sort of more susceptible and especially young students. And to me, on the next slide is really when we think about it in the context of climate, that there's this important piece here, which is that in a study of 75,000 students, they found that students taking an exam on a 90 degree day versus a 75 degree day were 12% more likely to fail that exam. And so this is equivalent to the black white achievement gap. So we have a real important uh, focus here where if we think about the average life of a school building, how many 90 degree days are in our future. And so with that, I want us to kind of get into the action. And so that is it for me. So thanks so much. Um, on the next slide is just my contact info and some other resources. And we get into indoor air quality a lot more in depth uh, on a podcast called Inhabit, which is a Perkins and Well production. So thanks so much. Thank you, Erica, for giving us an all too quick dip into this really deep body of research that connects the built environment with, with our human health. So now we're going to hear from Wyatt Ross. Wyatt is an energy and sustainability engineer with CMTA. CMTA is recognized as a national leader for delivering high performance sustainable projects. Their portfolio includes the first net zero school in the country, Richardsville Elementary in Kentucky over a decade ago. It also includes more recently the first as far as I know, uh, net zero school retrofit Buckley Elementary in Connecticut. And it includes the first building to combine well certification and net zero, which happens to be CMT's very own headquarters in Louisville. So Wyatt, thank you so much for being with us here today in Brian's stead. Where should we start? Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, so happy to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, so in addition you know, to talking about the health benefits and, and performance ramifications of our HVAC systems, you know, we also wanna talk about the environmental impacts that our HVAC systems can have in our schools. And so um, today I wanna talk a little bit about um, what these modern systems look like in juxtaposition to kind of this legacy equipment that we're talking about and what that means from uh, an emission standpoint from our buildings and then also what are some tools and some recent legislation that we can let uh, leverage to help achieve and um, implement and deploy these systems. So if you jump to the next slide. So um, with these modern systems, kind of a core concept that we're looking at here is the concept of electrification. And so um, when we're talking about electrification, what that means is it's the switching of utilizing um, combustion on site in our buildings to generate heat as it relates to HVAC um, and switching to systems or technologies that are fully electric. And, and the reasoning behind this is that when we switch our buildings to utilizing systems that are electric, eventually we can depend on renewable energy such as solar, nuclear, wind, hydro um, to generate that electricity. And the benefit that that has, uh, not only at the building level, but at the global level, is that that transition will allow us to use um, more, uh, less greenhouse gas intensive um, fuel sources that you see here on this slide. And it also um, will decrease the amount of air pollution that we're seeing both at the building level and our local community level, um, and also at the global uh, scale. So if you jump to the next slide, for the most part, when we're talking about the fuel sources that we're utilizing for generating heat in our buildings, whether it be boilers um, or packaged rooftop equipment, we're typically talking about natural gas. And so what you can see in that purple bar there is uh, when we combust this gas, it has a significant greenhouse gas impact, which contributes to climate change. Um, and then in addition to combusting that natural gas, there's also what we call fugitive emissions. Uh, which are associated with the leakage of natural gas as it's distributed to your building. And so if we can remove these systems or the use of the, these fuels from our buildings, uh, we can make a, a tremendous impact on reducing our overall carbon impact. Next slide. Um, so we talked a little bit about legacy versus modern equipment. Um, there's kind of two points that I want to make. And so when we're talking about legacy equipment, uh, to Emma's point, these aren't necessarily old pieces of equipment are in our uh, buildings. It's more so that it's technology that is more traditional. It's been around um, and it's not going to meet the needs of our schools in the future. And so we're talking about, you know, hot water boilers, steam boilers, things that uh, can't achieve the efficiency levels of some of the modern equipment that we're talking about. Um, but it also could be electric heat, um, which is, you know, resistant heat, similar to getting hot when you touch a light bulb, um, only going to achieve an efficiency of around 99%. The other downside of these legacy equipment, uh, pieces of equipment is that they can only generate heat and we're coming into a world which will uh, more and more so require cooling. And so this modern equipment, which we can more broadly classify as heat pump technology has a couple of benefits. One, it's extremely more efficient, as you can see, 200 to 700% efficient uh, because it relies on moving heat rather than generating heat. Um, and then the second benefit is that they can also simultaneously provide cooling. Uh, so they're more of a dual purpose technology. Next slide. And so when we, when we look at comparing these, these technologies um, from an operational emission standpoint, um, because you're probably wondering, just because I electrify, where is that electricity coming from? There's still emissions associated with it. Um, so what this is looking at is if we take a sample school um, in a region that has uh, currently a fairly dirty grid, somewhere where that's using mostly coal-fired fi uh, power plants to generate electricity, and we look at switching between a natural gas boiler that's generating heat at the building versus an electric heat pump, what are the total emissions of those two systems, including the emissions from electricity? And so what we see is over time, over a 30 year period, as we expect our grid to deploy more and more renewable energy and become cleaner over time, um, by the end of those two systems life, a school that deployed electric heat pumps can expect to reduce emissions by almost 80% compared to a school that chose to use a natural gas boiler starting today. Um, and so this just kind of gives you the sense of scale of the um, greenhouse gas emissions of an electrified new technology HVAC system can save. Next slide. So all that said, you know, you still have to pay for these systems. And so how do we do that? And so, you know, I think it's really important to um, be aware of the recent legislation that has passed. I'm sure most people have heard about the Inflation Reduction Act at this point. There's kind of two big things uh, that I want you to take away from the slide, and then you can use the rest as a text as a reference. But um, the big thing is that before, in the recent past, these tax credits have been available in some form of another, or they have existed. 
but they have not been available to public K-12 schools. And so that has changed with this legislation. And so now there are incentives available that can help cover the cost or any premium associated with these modern technology. Um, and then the other big change is that for some of these technologies, the tax credit base um, has increased from 10% in the case of geothermal heat pumps up to 30%. Um, and there's additional incentives that can potentially raise that. And so what that means is that not only can these heat pumps uh, to modern technologies meet a lot of the technical needs um, of heating and cooling, but they can also meet some of the financial needs that districts are facing. Next slide. So again, we won't go into all of the technologies that are covered by this bill, um, but really the big one for our, for our conversation today is ground source heat pumps. Um, also solar photovoltaics are covered, battery storage, some microgrid technology. Um, and a whole slew of other technologies that we won't have time to get into. Uh, next slide. And so um, just real quickly, I wanted to jump into, you know, kind of a case study. This is a school um, that Sarah mentioned that we worked on in Connecticut, net zero energy renovation. Um, it did not leverage the tax credits, but this is kind of a case study to prove out what it would have looked like if they had, how beneficial that could have been. Um, and so this is a, a life cycle study over life cycle cost analysis over 25 years. And you can see um, if we just compared to a code minimum system that we could have deployed, um, it would have cost roughly $13 million over the course of that system's life to own and operate. And so if we compare that to the geothermal system that they went with on the next slide, you can see that we were able to provide them with a system um, that had almost a $3 million savings over the course of the system's life. The only downside is that it did have a, a small premium associated um, with going with that HVAC solution. And that was gonna result in a six year payback. So if we jump to what these new tax credits could have done for the financial story of the system is that it would have resulted in a 34% tax credit that could have covered 34% of the total cost of the entire HVAC line item associated with the system um, and reduced the uh, six year payback to one year. So almost an immediate return on investment and saved $5 million um, over the course of the system's life for that district. And so the, the, you know, the key takeaway here is that with these tax credits, one, before the tax credit, this HVAC system still made a lot of sense and had a lot of merit um, for all the health reasons that uh, Emma was talking about, or sorry, uh, Erica was talking about, as well as uh, the energy savings associated with the system. Um, but with the tax credits, it almost becomes this no brainer, first cost, best option, um, and then all of those ancillary benefits as well. And so this just uh, shows the magnitude of impact these credits could have for looking at these options. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> so quick, you know, sustainability playbook here. How do we actually go about achieving and implementing these systems? And so when you have a project come online where you're looking to uh, maybe do an HVAC retrofit or new construction or whatever it may be, kind of step one is that we really need to make sure that we're asking um, for the right qualified people that can design and deliver these systems. And so including language in our RFPs that um, talk about performance outcomes, whether it be the health and wellness outcomes, the energy savings, the system types. If you're asking the right questions, the RFP, you'll bring people to the table that can deliver those solutions. Um, the second thing is during design, um, design of any school can be messy. And so you have to have advocates both on the design team side with the architect, the engineers, um, structural uh, contractors and on the school district side that can continue to ask the right questions, uh, make sure that we're talking about the right things and that we're focused on achieving those um, objectives that we talked about today. The third thing, and this one's really important, as we transition to more and more uh, modern systems and away from traditional systems where you know, contractors and estimators are more familiar, um, that transition can be a little bit of a pain period. And so estimators, you know, you know, if they aren't super familiar with these new systems, you might see them put in some buffer or safety factors associated with the cost of these new systems. Um, and that can kind of inherently price out these systems, um, maybe unintentionally. And so what we want to do is make sure that we're getting early pricing sets that are very detailed, um, kind of dig into the weeds and make sure that we're getting the right information so that we're not making any assumptions that might be wrong. Um, and, and, and falsely price out systems uh, that we would like to keep. So uh, the last step is then managing costs. And so I, I said it before, Buckley was able to achieve the geothermal HVAC system with a dedicated, dedicated, dedicated ventilation system and all these additional benefits before um, these ITC tax credits for the Inflation Reduction Act. So there are ways to keep projects within budget um, as long as you're prioritizing the right things. And so if, 
we're aware of what the goals and the systems that we can deploy, we can prioritize those in and almost always make it work. And then on top of that, we now have these new financial resources um, and incentives that can kind of be icing on top to make these uh, more feasible. And that's it for me. Perfect. Thank you so much, Wyatt. So now that we've heard from Erica about the importance of HVAC systems in schools and Wyatt about electrification and how the Inflation Reduction Act is reimagining the funding landscape for all electric retrofits, I am really pleased to pass the mic to Julia Casagrande, who will be giving us a behind the scenes look at New York City's recent and powerful commitment to electrifying schools. So take it away from here, Julia. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, and it's great to have all of that information from Erica and Wyatt. Um, I'm excited to dive into how New York City is working to electrify our schools and, um, and how we're navigating the different laws and priorities that we have in this space. Um, so about me, my name is Julia Casagrande. I'm a policy advisor at the mayor's office. I work on researching and developing policy for New York City in the building decarbonization space and in the climate retrofit space. Um, we've worked on developing policy like Local Law 154, all, our all-electric new buildings law, and our clean construction executive order. Um, but I also work on coordinating and advising um, city agencies that are doing decarbonization work, um, particularly when there are multiple agencies involved. And that's what I'm going to get into today um, on, the, on the school electrification front. Um, so next slide. Um, I was just going to give a little background on um, the New York City school system. We have over 1,400 school buildings in the city, um, and that's the largest school district in the country, and then also the largest contributor to municipal energy use um, within the city. So this um, chart on the right shows that K-12 schools are 32% of our municipal energy use, and it's also our largest source of municipal um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I would note these buildings are old. Uh, we're talking about legacy systems that may or may not be new. In this case, they are largely very old boilers. Um, we have old electrical systems. We have old envelopes. We have a lot of historic buildings that are 100 years old, and they are registered historic sites. So it's complicated to retrofit these buildings. Um, that being said, our school construction authority and our Department of Education have been doing a lot to, to reduce the um, emissions of our buildings. Um, as of 2007, we have all our new buildings following Green Schools Guide, which is um, the New York City schools specific version of LEED compliance. And we have about 10 to 15 new schools that are built each year um, and are, have been following this since 2007. Obviously, it's been updated a lot of times since then. Um, we also have a lot of efficiency work that's been going on. So across the portfolio, um, the municipal portfolio, the city has reduced emissions by 26%. Um, and then there's some a lot of innovative work with green roofs. We have a net zero school in Staten Island, PS62R, um, increasing amounts of solar, et cetera. But there's still a lot of work to do in this space. Um, a lot of the improvements to date have been from like fuel switching and the electrical grid um, cleaning up and, and there's a lot of work to do. So what I was going to highlight is we have 200 schools remaining, about 200 schools remaining that are burning number four heating oil and emit um, very relatively high amounts of air pollution. So that's sort of the universe that we're focusing on for this electrification initiative. And um, I'll go into that more on the next slide. Um, so in the landscape, there's also some competing laws and priorities that are, are relevant to um, the policy decisions that we came up with. Um, fuel oil 4, I don't know, um, depending on where, where folks live, may or may not use this fuel, but it's, it's a heavy residual fuel oil and it has high, emits high amounts of air pollution. Um, this phase out of fuel oil 4 was required by 2030. Um, when we when we set this policy, we actually just uh, last month passed a law that's accelerating this phase out, and now it's going to be required by 2025 for schools and 2027 for the private sector. Um, we also have biofuel heating requirements, which um, are state state mandates. There's city mandates, but then the state mandates are more um, stringent than city. 
so that's what we're following. We're going to be um, having to use 10% biodiesel by 2025 and 20% by 2030 in all of our heating oil. We also have Local Law 97, which is our building performance um, law, and there's requirements for private buildings, which um, gets more press, but we also have municipal operations requirements that are actually more stringent. Um, we have to reduce our municipal portfolio emissions by 40% by 2025 and 50% by 2030, and that's from 2006 levels. Um, the last law I would note is Local Law 154, which is our all electric new buildings law. Um, we have all, all schools will be electric um, by law as of January 5th, 2025, but they're already building all electric schools at this point. Um, I would just also note that there's all these laws that we have to comply with, and then there's also our priority, which is um, to make sure that we're focusing on improving air quality and delivering benefits to New Yorkers, um, particularly in neighborhoods with high asthma and those that have borne the brunt of um, environmental injustice in the past. So on the right here is a slide. Um, that shows the discrepancy of asthma emergency department visits from air pollution in New York City. So we have Northern Manhattan and the Bronx really, and then some in central Brooklyn um, really feeling the brunt of that. Um, next slide. Thank you. So with all of that in mind, um, we needed a plan to get our schools off of fuel oil number four and also to leapfrog um, to electrification to meet our decarbonization requirements. So we did not want to do any more replacement in kind, putting in new natural gas boilers that would replace fuel oil boilers. Um, we wanted to, we definitely wanted to focus on electrification. Um, however, we have 1400 schools, so we couldn't electrify them all right away. Um, so in the fall, um, Mayor Adams announced the Leading the Charge initiative, which is a $4 billion commitment to electrifying existing school buildings. Um, and we have 100 schools that are be electrifying by 2030. Um, you may remember from the earlier slide that we have 200 schools that are burning number four fuel oil. So what we, what we decided to do was no new boilers. Um, we are retrofitting the existing boilers um, to comply with the short-term regulations for um, to phase out number four fuel oil and have the biodiesel contents um, and it, using our capital, our big dollars to install heat pumps. So we're doing an operation and maintenance retrofit on the existing boilers, get the, the quick air quality benefits at a much lower cost. And we're focusing the big dollars on our school electrification project. Um, also note that we're starting in communities. We prioritize, prioritize communities with high asthma rates as well as a heat vulnerability index and um, high truck traffic, which just adds more pollution to the area. Um, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to speak a little about the collaborative strategy um, that we did to, that we used to get to this um, agreement. Uh, within the government, we have our Office of Management and Budget. Um, we, who committed to not funding new boilers. So they really uh, decided where the money was gonna be going and, and that's how we, um, we got the commitment for the electrification. Um, our school construction authority and department of education worked super closely together to figure out the technicality of these conversions. Um, as I said, our buildings are really old. It's difficult to retrofit them. Um, so they, these teams worked really closely together on the technical aspects. Our Department of Citywide Administrative Services oversees our portfolio of energy use for the city at, at large. So we worked with them and then our office um, more on the policy and advising. Um, we also have had, a, we've had a lot of support for this initiative. Um, environmental justice groups, labor unions and community groups have been advocating for school electrification way before this announcement was made. Um, there was a clean, Creating Green Healthy Schools initiative that was directed specifically at, um, at the mayor's office to implement changes such as this. Um, of course, there's more to do and they continue to helpfully push us to go further. Um, but largely we've gotten a lot of support, support in this area. And I just put some screenshots of tweets there. Um, on expected outcomes, we, we saw a huge air quality improvement from when we phased out number six heating oil, which was um, the prior phase out. This was completed by 2016. Um, from that phase out, we see an annual reduction of 1,200 tons PM2.5 in the air, air around New York. 
and that prevents 210 approximately um, premature deaths annually. Um, we're gonna, we expect this trend to be um, continued with the accelerated phase out of fuel in number four. And in prioritizing environmental justice areas for electrification, we wanna make sure that um, these areas have the additional benefit. Um, and we will see a reduction in air pollution and improved health and keep New York City on the path to meet our climate mandates through leapfrogging to electrification. Um, just note, like the city has a lot of power in where we spend our money and um, we see this as a $4 billion market signal uh, over eight years towards electrification and decarbonization. So we're hoping this will help spur, spur the market in New York City um, to have more contractors on board to, to do the work. And um, that's all I've got. That was awesome. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Julia. The work that you all are doing in New York City is really nation leading. And we're so thrilled that you could share it with the audience today. We hope these panelists have inspired you all to think about what is possible in your own communities. After all, there is so much to be gained. You can read more about the six benefits of moving to all electric high performance systems in the paper. Our speakers touched on almost all the benefits here today. And so right now, I'm gonna assume that you're with us and that you are compelled and that you are ready to move to action. So let's go to the next slide. The report has a recommendation section at the end that is organized by role. So are you a state policymaker? Are you a school board member? Are you a parent? We've offered our thoughts on how you can champion the work uh, from wherever you sit in the world. So please take a look at those recommendations. Um, so I'm actually gonna focus now on the potent moments for intervention that we cannot afford to miss. The first is new construction. New construction is one of those rare opportunities when we hold the responsibility of making good 50 year choices. So we really need to ensure that all new construction incorporates this modern HVAC technology. This can be a challenge, right? As Wyatt mentioned, there are contractors and some design partners that are frankly more comfortable with how they've been doing things, this legacy equipment and change is hard. So if your community is building a new school, make sure your town leaders are clear on the importance and benefits of embracing these modern systems right from the start of the process. And make sure your design partners are also on board or will be very difficult to move in this direction. The second potent moment that we need to have our eyes peeled for is systems replacement. HVAC systems reach the end of their useful life and need to be replaced. The key here is to avoid what we call a like-for-like -like replacement. And instead, we need to make a break for this modern equipment. And again, here it's about establishing modern HVAC systems as the goal early on. We can't wait until systems fail to have the conversation. At that point, it's an emergency and we're destined for a like for like replacement. And the last opportunity is really about facilities planning. Our facilities plans that actually too few of our schools have need to reflect this desired transition from legacy systems to modern systems. These plans are some kind, sometimes called decarbonization plans when they absorb this lens. And our partners at New Buildings Institute have a great tool for that work that we will put into the chat for you all. Next slide. So with those three points of intervention in mind, you know, we've all got work to do. Uh, and we've got two easy to digest one pagers that you can use to open the conversation with leaders in your town. Um, one is on the big ideas, right? A non-technical set of guideposts for really building understanding and therefore confidence in this area. And the second is a one pager that recaps these six benefits of modern systems. So please use these as conversation openers. They are available on our website. Um, that we'll put again in the chat so it's handy for you here. Next slide. And lastly, before we get to Q&A, I, I really want to recognize all of our wonderful supporting organizations. 
We have a stellar audience here today, largely because they helped us get the word out. And we are particularly appreciative of the organizations who contributed staff time, our advisors, we had a wonderful set of advisors on this paper, our leading contributors in the field, and we are so grateful that they devoted time to improving our thinking and our writing on this topic. So a big shout out to ASHRAE, the Center for Green Schools, the Collaborative for High Performance Schools, CMTA, New Buildings Institute, Perkins and Will, and Stanford. So thank you so much. So it's time for your questions and I'm gonna exercise my moderator uh, role here and ask the first one. So for each of our panelists in 30 seconds, this is your short little sound bite. Tell us what is the most important thing that you want the audience to take away from your presentation. And we're gonna go in order. So Dr. Etland, Erica, you are up first. Awesome. So, I mean, I think one thing that became really evident from the chat is that we HVAC is a part of this, but it is not the whole solution. And I think we have to really be thinking about, especially when we're talking about equity, that we take sort of this look at the hierarchy of controls and where is HVAC a part of the solution, but recognizing that all buildings are not gonna be able to kind of get to the Ferrari of HVAC systems, that we need to be able to sort of think about where does behavior change come in in terms of energy conservation? Where does it come in in terms of reducing, uh, you know, asthma triggers? So I do think there's, you know, just something that I feel very strongly about that's coming through the chat is that it's not just about outdoor air pollution, it's about the indoor. And I think that's where sort of the human behavior side complements some of these HVAC uh, decisions. And then real quick, I just, from coming from an architecture firm, I think it's really important that you see yourselves as advocates to hold them accountable, to make sure that they're giving you the life cycle costs, that they're really trying to sort of work dynamically with people like CMTA and having the correct engineers on the job to make sure that they're providing sort of the full energy savings. Because I know there's some back and forth that health is, you know, wow, we're talking about health first and not about energy. But I do think it's so often forgotten about what we're really trying to get to. And it is so foundational to sort of the main purpose of a school. So uh, let's let's think holistically about all of this. Great. Why that was Erica's 30 seconds, maybe. What's your 30 seconds? Great. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess two things. Um, one, I think it's really important to take away from this conversation just how important HVAC systems are um, on the impacts of health, wellness, thermal comfort, thermal health, um, emissions, energies, cost savings. I think a lot of times HVAC can kind of be an afterthought when it comes to designing our schools. And um, so hopefully a takeaway is that, you know, there's actually really important implications to what types of decisions we make as it relates to HVAC. Um, and then, you know, the second thing is there's a lot of things in the chat about um, consultants saying no. Um, one of the things that I would like to say is, you know, it's your building. Um, you need to really push. Um, if someone is telling you no, they probably have not done it before. Um, these are not, you know, bleeding edge technologies. These are things that have been around a long time. There are ways to make these um, solutions work almost always. And again, it's not going to happen designing in a vacuum. Um, it does have to take into account energy efficiency or else you're going to pay out the nose for a lot of heating and cooling you don't need. Uh, but if you can do envelopes right, if you can make other improvements to the building, um, you can make these things pencil out. And so you need to be, uh, it's your building that you're paying for it and really leaning on your consultants to give what you're asking for um, is, a, is a key thing. Awesome. I love it. Julia, your big takeaway for the audience here. Sure. Um, I would just say from our perspective in New York City, there's so much work to do. There's so much work being done all the time. And um, I think this this project and this initiative has really highlighted that like when money is being being spent, we need to make sure that it's being spent in the right areas. Um, so putting the big dollars in electrification and then prioritizing where we're doing it so that we actually make sure we see um, the biggest uh, improvement in air quality indoor and outdoor um, for, for the folks who have the biggest impacts of asthma. Um, and um, yeah, that's what I think. Great, Emma, well, I'm gonna pass the baton over to you. Do you wanna start us off with the next question from the audience? 
Sure thing. So this first one is actually for Erica. So going back up to the top here. So we all know that you are a public health scientist and that you've been applying your expertise to K-12 school design for many years now. So this audience question was asking you to reflect on how often and whether the concepts of electrification and decarbonization more broadly come up in these conversations um, when we're talking solutions to the health and performance concerns that schools are facing. So from your experience, does electrification and decarbonization come up? If not, how do we bridge that gap? I would say that we're at a point right now where those topics are coming up a lot more than health is. I would say that health is not as easily quantifiable as energy and cost savings. And so it's more of bridging our gap to be thinking about what are the health ramifications and what makes the most sense for our communities. Um, you know, I think this is something where we can talk about decarbonization, but it kind of gives me a little bit of like a back to the 70s where we had an energy crisis and we started removing all of our windows from our classrooms. And so we really have to be having a sort of a holistic conversation um, about health. And that's why I really feel, and I appreciate sort of me getting to go first in the sense that if we're going to have a conversation about decarbonization, we also have to be thinking about this in terms of climate adaptation and what are sort of the acute and short-term benefits of making some of these uh, changes and investments that it's not just a sort of a payout long-term down the line, but also things that, you know, especially with schools across, you know, New England and even to Cincinnati closing for extreme heat, we know those things will be felt pretty quickly. Um, and it, it's, a, it's an equity issue too. Who gets to have a decarbonization conversation is not for everybody. And so it is about how we're going to kind of lift all boats as we're talking about this. Great, great. Um, why I've, I've got a question for you and it, it builds on some of what Erica was saying earlier too. So, you know, when I think about districts that are building new schools right now, I mean, here I am on my high horse talking about how we can't miss this opportunity. And yet, um, as you know, probably better than anyone in this room, construction costs are really high, right? And community leaders are understandably sensitive to increasing tax bills. Um, what would you say to a school building committee that is contemplating a gas boiler and new construction today as a response to those you know, very real, um, very challenging fiscal considerations. I mean, you know, Erica talked about a Ferrari is, you know, can we afford the, afford the Ferrari? Mm -hmm. No, it's a great question. And, you know, there, there's some legitimacy to that question. And there's also, um, there are things happening that, you know, you can be wary of that so you can avoid ballooning costs that, you know, may be more uh, figurative than literal. And so, um, you know, I would say one, first and foremost, I think there was a lot of great observations in the chat about energy conservation and other things that can be implemented into design so that you're, you know, right sizing HVAC systems. So you may not need the Tesla Cybertruck um, to get the work job done. You know, you could might be able to get a more uh, a Nissan Leaf or something of that nature, a more economy electrified system um, to meet your needs. And so you know, first and foremost, when I when I talk about managing cost, I think that's a big part of it. Is it, is it are your consultants, is your design team, are you as owners um, engaged in a conversation to figure out how to shift cost around so that you can, you know, make an economic decision? The second thing is, you know, the reality is that there is um, inflation in the construction market right now and costs are ballooning and being able, you know, in decades past where you really could almost always keep these systems within budget. Um, that can be tougher to do right now. And there is a premium associated with these systems. And so leveraging the ITC, um, I can't emphasize that enough, uh, these new tax credits that are available. Um, you may not be able to go geothermal, and so your tax credit options may be limited. But if you can, if that's an option, if you have the land area, um, if you've minimized your loads enough to where you don't need as large of a well field as maybe you would for the standard construction, um, you can leverage those tax credits, and that can be... Um, in transformation as far as the financials of that project, making it the lowest first cost option. Um, so I would make sure that you've explored all options if you're going down that route. The other thing that I would add is if you think about that 30 year time horizon that I said, uh, where I showed a heat pump compared to a natural gas boiler. If you're putting in a boiler today, one thing that you, you know, it's hard to quantify, but something to keep in the back of your mind is 
what will the, what will the uh, regulation environment look like in 20 years, in 30 years, um, in 10 years? And so what, you know, how could those regulations impact the cost of operating a boiler um, when you could have switched to electrified option and had more control um, over the pollution associated with that technology? Thanks, Wyatt. So I think I'm going to jump in here and have a switch gears a little bit to, to talk about ventilation since we've been heavy on the electrification side here. So Julia, if you'll join us for this question, the New York City commitment is very focused on electrification of space heating equipment. But as we've talked about today, ventilation is key to student health as well. So curious if you could give us a little bit of the details on how ventilation fits into this decarbonization plan and how do you see electrification unlocking those complementary efforts on ventilation? Yeah, of course. And there's um, a lot more detail of the actual retrofit plan than I could fit into 10 minutes, but the, the electrification um, projects absolutely include upgraded mechanical ventilation um, in classrooms and in assembly spaces. Um, there's also, we, we understand the link between um, adequate ventilation and performance and the school department make sure that what we have is optimized and what we're doing is um, providing more, more ventilation as we're moving forward. Um, I would also note that these projects, I saw a lot of questions in the chat around efficiency and um, the, the schools that we're working on to electrify absolutely, absolutely include efficiency measures as well um, to optimize the mechanical system. And then there's a lot of work that's being done across the board, again, around sort of optimization and right timing. So like if we're doing work on a roof, making sure that we're upgrading the insulation on the roof so that it has the maximum efficiency components and same things with windows. Um, when we have a new roof, we want to make sure we put in solar. Um, so I think with, with a portfolio of this size, a lot of the work is around planning and strategizing how to make the best use of sort of existing um, work that will go on so that we can incorporate ventilation, electrification, and efficiency as well. Great, thank you, Julia. Back over to you, Sarah. We might have time for one or two more questions. Great. Um, I guess I'll I'll go back to why here for one more question on the cost side. Um, are the costs for Buckley that you presented are those are those just for the ground source heat pump system and and how do you how do you think that about that within a broader cost environment? Like, were you able to deliver that project, which was net zero, a renefit, and ground source heat pump? Like, how did the overall project cost per square foot kind of compare with a conventional approach? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, um, the cost in the life cycle analysis I presented were specifically um, for the HVAC equipment. So, I think you know around four million dollars upfront for uh, the base case. Um, and I think we ended up around $5 million, so about a million-dollar premium um, in total to upgrade to the HVAC system, plus geothermal, all the ventilation improvements, all the things that we did um, at that school um, when it was all said and done. And so the, the total construction cost, I think, came in around $27 million. Um, I could be misquoting that. I'm not entirely sure, um, but I believe that's correct. So um, the well field itself was around... $850,000 for that school. Um, when you take into account what you're leaving behind when you switch to a geothermal system, so that, that's a big part of getting into the weeds of the cost estimate. You no longer need the boiler, you no longer need the cooling tower, you no longer need um, you know, the natural gas service to the building potentially if you're fully electrified. There's a lot of things that kind of get um, reduced um, from those costs that can be missed. So all of those are factored in um, to the life cycle analysis as well as um, maintenance cost savings, um, water cost savings, and then operational cost savings from energy savings, obviously. Um, and then with the tax credit, um, in the case where we could have potentially, you know, if this was, if this had happened a year later and uh, Buckley could have leveraged the ITC, um, the way that that is working, because I saw a bunch of questions in the chat about it. And so um, the reason that uh, K through 12 public entities, they're not, they're tax exempt normally, the way that you can receive the tax credits is through what's called a direct payment. And so essentially what that's going to look like is um, the federal government is going to be cutting checks for the percents that you normally would have gotten from off of your, your tax bill. Um, you're just getting that off of the cost of the system. And so there's a lot of guidance that's going to come out from the um, 
IRS here shortly, uh, kind of explaining the details of how that payment process would look, will look like, um, but that's the way that it will be implemented. And so that's how that would have um, impacted the front end financials of the, of the system. Did that answer the question? Perfect. Thanks, Wyatt. So you took us straight to the end of the hour. So I think that's our last question of the day. Uh, thank you again to our three speakers for joining us. And thank you all for joining us as well. We hope that you are leaving feeling motivated to take action. Give that full report in our one pagers a read, especially focusing in on those recommendations towards the end. Uh, we would love to hear from you too. So here are mine and Sarah's email addresses. We'd be happy to connect you with speakers if needed. And again, you will receive a recording of this webinar soon by email. So thank you again and have a great day, everybody.